All What You Eat, Part 2, American Roots of Food Culture, and American Entitlement to Meat. If there's one thing that distinguishes American culture, is its heavy reliance on meat, something historian Maureen Ugo was referred to as an entitlement to meat. The abundance of land in colonial America meant that it was relatively easy to raise livestock, and so they had large ac good access to meat, dairy, and eggs. And during the Revolutionary War, the British soldiers would remark that the American soldiers seemed taller, and that perhaps it was because they were fed better. During around the time of the Revolutionary War, a French traveler went through America, and he remarked that Americans seemed to eat eight times more meat as they did bread, and he thought that was just astonishing. Some food historians have said that vegetables were not really considered essential for a complete meal, and it was often served as a garnish, a flavoring, or medicine. Because you think about early colonists, pork to them was almost free. They had all this land, and they could just let the hogs loose, and the hogs would go out into the woods and find their own food and water, so the farmers didn't have to feed them or even really care for them. And then once or twice a year, they would go out into the woods, and it, it maybe they hunted them to kill them, or they were able to gather them up, but either way, they just went out into the woods and gathered the hogs, such that pork was very, very cheap for them. And Americans really did feel an entitlement to meat. During the 19th century, when a lady of obviously low income purchased or asked for a tenderloin from a Boston meat seller, he suggested that she could save money by buying a round steak instead. I don't know if he made that remark in kindness or not, but that is not how she took it. She responded, Do you suppose because I don't come here in my carriage, I don't want just as good a meat as rich folk have? Affordable meat created some semblance of equality in America. Although this lady did not expect to have the same carriages or mode of transport as the rich folk, she did feel entitled to the same meat. Meat eaters ruled the vegetarians. As Americans became increasingly proud of its republic empire and as European countries established colonies around the world, there seemed a pattern to some that that cultures who ate a lot of meat were dominating those who did not eat a lot of meat. And so meat became kind of a source of strength, perhaps American exceptionalism. This idea is still alive today. If you drive through the state of Nebraska, you might see a bumper sticker like this one that says, Eat beef. The West wasn't run on salad. The idea is that America is strong, a carnivore like a hulk or lion. And this implies that regions relying on vegetarian diets are weak herbivores, prey, certain to be dominated by others. This belief was even held by some of the people in the vegetarian countries who were being ruled. In India, which was a British colony during this time, the first half of the 20th century, for people who were of the Hindu religion, they can't eat meat, right? But Mahatma Gandhi, the Gandhi you're thinking of when I say the word Gandhi, he noticed that some people, some of his teachers, were secretly eating meat. And when he asked a friend why they were doing that, his friend answered, We are a weak people because we do not eat meat. The English are able to rule over us because they are meat eaters. Now we know that that isn't actually the truth. We saw in the previous part of the You Are What You Eat series that the Roman Empire was fueled largely by bread. And certainly that was a formidable army. The flexibility of food culture. If all this discussion about the role of food and culture doesn't seem to have a direct point, that is the point. What we need as far as nourishment for my food has remained the same for tens of thousands of years. But what we need, need out of food as far as our food culture, our society, social norms, well, that has changed, and it always changes across space and time. The role of food in human societies, in a cultural way, is very flexible. Let's consider the flexibility of food culture by visiting briefly two controversial issues today, farm animal welfare and global warming, both having a lot to, to do with meat, so especially important in America. Consider this observation. 
in a land where almost everybody eats turkey on Thanksgiving, a president goes through a ritual where they bring a live turkey to him, and then the president pardons the turkey. That turkey gets to live, and then he goes and eats a dinner, which is almost certainly going to include turkey, which was, you know, got by killing another turkey. So it's almost like the president saying, this turkey in front of me, because I can see it right here, I'm not going to kill it and eat this, but I'm going to let somebody else kill a different turkey, and then I'll eat the meat. That seems to be a little schizophrenic in our, in our views towards the chicken. And presidents have been doing this for a while. Um, you know, certainly President Obama's done it, President George W. Bush, President Clinton, H.W. Bush. I'm not sure how far it goes back, but this is a ritual now in America. And why do we do this? I want to suggest that in a way we are confused about our views, but another way, what the president may be saying is this. We are a meat-eating culture. We think it's okay to eat meat. But we also, we also put some value on this animal's life. We have some sympathy for the animal emotions. So in a way it's like saying, although we, do, we are going to kill animals to eat us meat, we're also going to treat them humanely. You know, three decades ago, animal welfare was almost a non-issue. You know, in the 80s, if someone called you a vegetarian, that was kind of like being called a communist. But now things have completely changed. A lot of animal advocacy groups, even some animal rights groups, has the sympathy of a large part of the American population. And livestock industries are also evolving to demonstrate more care about animal treatment and to be more open about it. You know, when... when when animal rights groups go undercover into a farm and they expose cruelty and they put it up on YouTube, it's not only animal advocates that cry, this is horrible. The livestock industries do it as well. They say, these people are making all of the industry look bad. These people need to be stopped. To what extent does the ordinary American care about animal welfare? Well, I do a lot of research on this issue. My research suggests that about one-third of Americans really don't care at all about how animals are treated. But about two-thirds believe that while society has no obligation to make sure animals are happy and content, society should make sure that animals do not suffer. Only 1% of the population believe that farm animals are entitled to a happy and content life. And while there are some consumers who would rather not know how meat, dairy, and eggs are produced, there are others who insist upon transparency. They want to know everything. Is, was it cage-free? Did the animal have access to pasture? And so on. So much so that the skit comedy show Portlandia did a farce of this where a Portlandian couple enter a restaurant and they're going to order chicken, but they proceed to want to know everything about the chicken, including its name and whether it palled around with other chickens. It's a really funny skit. I encourage you to watch it. Let's consider egg production. About 95% of eggs in America today are produced in a battery cage system. This system I'm showing you here, where four to six birds are placed in a barren cage. The animal's biological needs are met very well, but the behavioral needs are, are not met. They're bored in the cage. They don't have much room to turn. They can't even turn around without bumping into another chicken. They don't have private nests for laying eggs. They don't have rooms for scratching areas. They don't have perches and so on. Some Americans believe that hens in such a system suffer. And so some U.S. states have banned these systems. And about, you go to any grocery store now, you have the option of cage-free eggs. That was not around like it is today, three decades ago. And 5% of all egg sales today are of the cage-free variety. I'm including organic in that 5%. So what about cage-free? Here's a picture of a cage-free system. Some people think it's more humane. If you ask the animal scientists like here in, at Oklahoma State University, they usually tell you that cage-free has some advantages and disadvantages over the cage system such that we don't really know if it's unambiguously better. The reason is that cage-free has some obvious advantages. The hens have more room. 
They can walk around. There's scratching areas for them to scratch. They like doing that. There's private nests for them to lay eggs. And this purchase. So they get to lead a more natural life. But on the other hand, they're in a flock with thousands and thousands of other hens. And hens feel the need to establish a pecking, pecking order. But they can only remember a pecking order that consists of only about 30 birds. Well, when, the, when they're in a flock with thousands and thousands of birds, they can never establish a pecking order. So there's perpetual violence of some sort, injury in there, and that's why mortality rates in a cage-free system are higher than in a battery cage system. Moreover, it costs about 25% more to produce cage-free eggs. And even though, here's the funny thing about consumers, whenever they go to the ballot box to vote on whether they want to ban the battery cage, they always vote to ban it. It's like voting to say, I want cage-free eggs, but when they go into the grocery store, most people are buying cage eggs. So they vote saying, I want to ban cage eggs, but then they go to the grocery store and they buy cage eggs. So Americans are still trying to figure out exactly what our views are on this. There's a compromise coming about between the battery cage and the cage-free egg system. As these words are written, the United Egg Producers and the Humane Society of the United States, the biggest egg producer group, the biggest animal advocacy group, as far as animal welfare is concerned, they've gotten together and they're sponsoring joint legislation that would phase out battery cages and replace them with enriched cages, like the ones you see here. Enriched cages have the advantage in that most animal scientists will say enriched cages, or colony cages as they're sometimes called, are un or unambiguously better than the battery cage system. So take a hen out of a battery cage system, put it into an enriched cage, animal scientists are going to say that hen is better off. And the reason is that the flock size is still small enough for them to establish a pecking order, so there's not much violence. They have more room, they have a perch, they have a private nest for laying eggs, they have a scratching area, most everything that they need. And right now, it doesn't look like that legislation to endorse enriched cages is going to pass because the beef and the pork industries have come out against it. They're scared that if there's legislation about how eggs must be produced, they're scared that that'll set a precedent for legislation about how hogs and cattle will be raised. Another reason for in switching to the enriched cages is that they're more efficient than the cage-free system. Remember I said the cage-free system increases production costs by about 25%? Well, egg production costs increase only about 14% for an enriched cages. So enriched cages are good and that animal scientists say it unambiguously gives the animals a better life and it doesn't raise prices as much as a cage-free system would. Now some people think that even a enriched cage or even a cage-free system where they're in a barn is, is not good enough. They want the hens to be outside to live a very natural life. And I'm showing you a picture here of a free-range farm that's actually just down the road from me. What you're seeing there is a silage hopper that's been converted to one big cage. That's where the hens go at night and protect them from the predators. But during the day, they let the hens out and the hens get to go around, scavenge for food. The farmer feeds them lots of food as well. It's a neat system. You know, I went there and it's, you feel good looking at the hens. I actually saw a rooster capture an insect and go bring it to a hen as a gift. And so it looks good. But there are some bad things about it once you look closer. The mortality rates of this farm are really, really high. Much, much higher, like five times higher than a cage-free system because they're out there in the open and hawks regularly come down and kill them. And also, production costs are really high. For, for this farm to sell eggs and make a profit, they, have to, they would have to charge about $6 per dozen. And most people are not willing to pay that, though some will. And the point of all this is to point out that to the extent in which cages are ethical and unethical, that's something we're currently debating right now. We're trying to figure out whether giving hens a better life is worth the higher mortality rates of the hens. And consumers haven't really answered that question yet. Change in food cultures, the global warming debate. When it comes to food, old 
habits die hard. A lot of what we like in food was passed down from our parents. But in other ways, we will quickly change our views in regards to food. Global warming is a relatively new issue. And a lot of people have already radically changed their diets and want other people to change their diets to reduce the carbon footprint of food. Um, as these words are being written and spoken, Al Gore recently announced he is becoming a vegan, ostensibly for environmental reasons. I don't think the research fully supports the idea that vegan diets have a lower carbon footprint, though in some cases they certainly do. But even though most people have come to believe that a vegan diet is a lower carbon footprint, and so a lot of schools have been doing a meatless Monday for environmental reasons and some other reasons. Even the Norwegian military has adopted a meatless Monday. So this is a new thing that's really spread and it shows just how quickly we will change our notions about what is ethical food and what we want to eat. Although we're still debating how to best lower our carbon footprint, we've already developed the ethical desire to do so. And I think that says, I think that says much about us. Food and identity. So you say you are what you eat. Well, first we have to decide what kind of identity we want to project. Stephen Colbert, the comedian and host of the Colbert Report, wrote in his book America Again that, as we all know, you are what you eat. And I'm proud to say Americans are the tastiest, crispiest, saltiest, most thoroughly processed corn-based people on earth. Plus, we come in enormous portions and our packaging is bright and cheery. Very funny, I know. But some people read that, they laugh, and then they lament. Sadly, that is true. And then they lament this because they're scared that we are passing this identity down to our children. We're giving them poor eating habits. So we are still trying to figure out exactly what our identity is in regards to food and what we want that identity to be for children. A food culture to admire. Let me end with a few words contrasting the food cultures of the developed world with their ancestors. Um, talk a little bit about the things that's good about our food system. Americans are very open to other food cultures. As, as we've seen in the last lecture, that, that wasn't always the case. Even in small towns, you find Chinese restaurants, Mexican restaurants, Italian restaurants. And yeah, I know, they're not cooking authentic Chinese, Mexican, and Italian foods. But still, it says a lot about our, our desire to experience the foods of other cultures. And in many ways, sometimes it seems like we like other people's cultures better than our own. That says a lot about us. It says a lot about our openness to the world and other people in a way that I think can only do good in the world, help to preserve peace. At the same time as we're more open to other people's food cultures, we insist on preserving our own food culture. We have not lost the culinary traditions of our ancestors, and we go to great efforts to preserve it. You can see this in the now popular attempts to brew Thomas Jefferson's recipe for pumpkin ale. And some people are even trying to make traditional apple cider just like Thomas Jefferson did, even use the exact same variety of apples. Let me give you a personal example. In historical South Carolina, people would, when they slaughtered a hog, they would try to use as much of the hog as they could. And they even made this thing called hash, where you take hogs' heads and you boil it in water. And you add other things to it, like you know, potatoes, onions, livers. It sounds disgusting, but it's actually very good. Now, people don't want, they still serve hash in the low country of South Carolina today, although they don't use hogsheads anymore. But about 10 years ago, my family and I decided well, we didn't want to completely lose the traditions of our region. And so we found a, probably a century old recipe on how to make hash. We bought hogsheads and we made it. And you look around the world, lots of people are doing very similar things. Food used to be a marker of social class, as we've seen, but in many ways, food is, serves as a f way of showing equality in the United States. Although some struggle to find enough to eat, people don't starve in the U.S. The poor not only sees welfare from government, but a SNAP card 
SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, I believe, that lets them to get free food, basically. It used to be people had food stamps where you'd go to the grocery store to buy food and I can't remember what they looked like, but when you, they paid for them, it, wasn't, it obviously wasn't cash. You could tell that these people were paying with food stamps, therefore they were poor. And it started to stigmatize the poor. Now they go to the grocery store, they pull out the SNAP card that looks just like a credit card, works just like a credit card. So now the poor can get free food and they're not stigmatized. They get to get free food while preserving their integrity. And so many people today believe that humans are entitled to good food. Food is a human right of many sorts, even if it's not in the American Constitution. By the way, I think in one of the many constitutions developed through the French Revolution, there was one form where it said, man has a right to eat. And if Jean Valjean from Les Miserables were alive today, he would not need to steal bread to feed his sister's child, but he would probably have to go on a diet. And regardless of our religion, most people now believe that we are products of nature and that we have a responsibility back to nature. And we take it seriously. This means that, you know, agriculture is, not, is anything but natural. It's not a natural process. Agriculture is the engineering of nature for human benefit. But, and we want to do that, but we want to do this engineering in a way that is environmentally friendly and humane. We have to use nature for our benefit, but we want to preserve nature as well. And we have a lot of challenges facing us as far as food. And to meet these challenges, it requires us to be forward-thinking, altruistic, and flexible in our food culture. And these are traits that I believe abound. You are what you eat. Well, I believe the developed world contains the most compassionate egalitarian, prosperous, and happy people to have ever existed, and these traits are manifested in the food that we eat.